everyone. You please join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for another opportunity. I thank you for a story of life transformation, a story of life transformation that you have given me. But it's not just offered to me, it's offered freely to everybody that is in here. So God, I ask that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Allow those that need to hear this message the most to hear it, as well as those that may think that they need to hear it the least. So God, fill this place and allow people to know that there can be transformation, there can be change. There's room for recovery, and you can find it here. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. amen. Hello. I stand here a new creation in Christ by no good works of my own. My name is Chris, and I'm recovering from drugs, alcohol, anger, and other character defects. For those that have been around since I got here, if you can't tell, I'm currently also suffering from food addiction. <laughs> I'm here tonight to share my testimony on who I was, what brought me here, and who I am today. I wanted to open by saying that I pondered for a very long time on how I'd present this message tonight. It didn't seem to benefit the loving God that we serve by trudging through the muck and the mud of my past. Yet in order for the newcomer, who is the most important person in this room, I will go through some of the newsworthy clips of my past so that you can see that none of us in this room are terminally unique. I cannot guarantee that I will fill your glass tonight, but I will guarantee that I'll empty mine while I'm up here. On March 12, 2011, I walked through the doors of this church, an angry, withdrawing drug addict at the end of his road. I'd been chewed up, spit out, destroyed relationships, lost more jobs in a recession, and was on the verge of losing the woman and children I loved and the baby that I had not yet met. I'd like to start with a verse from the Bible that I took on as my life verse. It comes to us from the book of Psalms, chapter 34, 4 through 6. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those that look to him with help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all of my troubles. This verse speaks to me every day of how the mess of my life was transformed to his message. Because in my darkest hour, I found myself right there at that altar, praying and shouting out to God that I needed help. I totally surrender, and to please save me from myself. When I was young, my parents had a book that went from my birth up through 12th grade. They collected things in this book, like my earliest pictures, when I spoke my first words, my old grade cards, and there was also a page that asked a question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I remember wanting to be a fireman, a police officer, a pizza maker, which I did when I was 16, a stuntman and a rock star. The last two I ended up dabbling in, but they weren't paid positions. It was more like I paid to get those roles, and by paying, I paid dearly. I can't ever remember the writing in the book that when I was young that I aspired to be a drug addict, a criminal, a liar, and a thug. But that was who I was to become in my adulthood. So let me tell you a little bit about the resume that I bring to the table. My father was a Vietnam vet who, upon returning to the States, didn't pay his taxes and ended up going on the run from the feds for the better part of 25 years, leaving my mom and I to fend for ourselves. My mother was a German immigrant and a victim of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse from her parents. Together, we made up the Fraley family. I was 12 when the feds came and changed the locks in the door to our house, locking both my mother and I from the lives that we had built as a family together. We were left to live in an old Honda Accord, and in the days that followed, my mother lost her job at the bank due to conflict of interest. The feds also froze and seized her bank accounts, so we were left with only each other. I began stealing drugs from her various boyfriends before finding an escape from reality with marijuana. I became a daily user by the age of 12, and I continued until I got sober. By 13, I had stabbed my first person, a man who had molested me as a child. I ended up doing my first stint in juvenile detention. By 15, I was in a gang and was charged with 75 counts of grand theft auto after being charged and indicted in a car theft ring. By 16, I had shot my first person and was again charged with another assault case to go along with a dirty urine test. This is my first introduction to rehab in a boys' home where I lived for nine months before being released to an aftercare program for another six months. Let me tell you, I did so well at rehab that I came back to film a sequel a year later. Yet this time, this time it was completely different. I knew how to tell the counselors what they wanted to hear. So again, I was found fit to join the outside world and dropped off the probation officer's caseload. I graduated the big time by the age of 18. I was facing 15 to 25 years for a series of home burglaries and the possession and sale of firearms. Looking back at how twisted I was during this period couldn't even begin to prepare me for who I was to become in my 20s and 30s. 
I was surrounded by drugs, alcohol, and violence, and I gravitated to all three with reckless abandon. The year was 1993 when I sat front row to two life-changing experiences. The first was the birth of my son, Cody, and the second was the introduction to the bride that I would take as my own for the next 18 years, cocaine. On my 21st birthday, life changed. I tried cocaine, and like all types of mind-altering substances, I loved it. I think through all this that my life stayed on this reckless course because I never was properly raised with a good moral compass. All my role models were actors on gangster movies and musicians that never said anything remotely positive. So I did what I thought would give me recognition or approval. And looking back now, a lot of that had to do with being abandoned by my father right before puberty. So the more I heard the words, you'll never amount to anything, you're worthless, and I wish you had never been born, the more I started to believe it. There's a saying that goes like this, the lie doesn't become truth until the person believes it. And I bought into that saying, hook, line, and sinker. I waited until 21 to start the hardcore drugs, both selling and using. And in that time, I had friends who were customers. They were also IV drug abusers. It scared and fascinated me all at the same time. The way they would lift off and then they would start flopping around on the floor before coming to and taking the trip all over again. They had told me, never try it this way. The high is way too strong and way too addicting. But due to my own compulsive and addictive behaviors, I had to see what the hype was all about, and I bought into it with my life. I finally crossed that imaginary line, and my life was never the same after that moment. I lost all of my humanity at that point, and the buzz, well, it became the driving force in my life. The hunger was never satisfied. It required more of me, and I fed it until there was nothing more to give. I lost my girlfriend, my son, and on many occasions, my freedom. And in the passing years, I got my first DUI, used any drug I could get my hands on, lost jobs, and in 1998, almost lost my life due to my lifestyle. I was at my son's mother's house when her then boyfriend stormed through the door and we began fighting. By the end of the fight, I had been stabbed seven times. I stumbled out the door to my friend's car and had him rush me to the hospital that was fortunately only two miles away. On that short drive, my sight became blurry before everything went black due to the blood loss. I faded into unconsciousness as we pulled into the ER parking lot. They say when you die, the last of your senses to go is your hearing. Let me tell you, at that point in time, there were no bright lights, no guiding angels, only my Heavenly Father trying to instill a sense of well-needed change in my life. The last thing that I heard was the doctor yelling clear as he tried to shock life back into my heart. I truly believe everything was black due to me not knowing Christ and who he is, who he was, and how I could be saved from even myself in the life that I was living at that time. I left the hospital a month later with a handful of prescription painkillers to add to my already long resume of drugs that I was addicted to. I clearly was still not ready to accept help or change in my life, and my life continued to get worse. I could use an entire book to illustrate the rest of my illustrious exploits, but I'd like to fast forward to May of 2003. It was, it was May of 2003 after leaving prison for the last time and being granted custody of my son due to him taking a bag of heroin as well as a syringe of his mother's to school when life was about to change for the better. My father had found me through the internet. He was living here in Fort Myers now. He had a new family, and his conscience had finally caught up with him. He had heard through the grapevine of my troubles and wanted to make up for the lost time with me. He moved my son here to the Shores neighborhood of Fort Myers, where I was introduced to the dad that I no longer knew. Life was great. I got a good job with a local marine mechanic. My son flourished in school here. In my past, well, I left that back in Toledo. The problem, you may ask, my past may have been left back in Toledo, but I was here, and I brought myself along down on that bus ride. It was only six months before I had found the element that I used to live in, and it was again surrounded by drugs, alcohol, and the underbelly of society. Within the next six months, I lost everything, including my son, and was sitting in a detox center on 41, wondering where it all went wrong. I stayed there for a week before going reluctantly to a Christian-based halfway house, where I learned about this guy named Jesus and how he sacrificed himself not only for your sins, but for the heinous sins that I had committed. I was beginning to thrive. I had a job, was going to two meetings a day, helping out at my church, and becoming the head of the halfway house after six months. Three months later, I had my own apartment, my son back, and a great job at a nursing home. The only thing I didn't have, well, that was the extra money that I needed for the material things that I was actually focusing on. So what better way for a new Christian to prosper in this material-driven world that we live in? Selling cocaine. That was my answer. Within 24 hours of that great idea, I was right back where I had left off. After a 48-hour bender, I was lying in bed to be startled by a knocking at my door. It was a friend of mine from church who needed me for something big. 
that something big is giving my testimony at our church during a Christian gospel concert. You know what? I did it. I told of how Jesus had saved me, how life had changed, and how great it was to be recognized as a child of God. And then I walked off that stage to a standing ovation. There were handshakes and hugs, the congregation telling me how big of an inspiration I was. And I left that night through the doors of that church ashamed, guilty, depressed, and at the end of my rope for not only being a failure, but a liar in the house of God. There could be no bigger sinner than I, and I had obviously learned nothing about Jesus at that point because I never went back, instead retreating to my own devices before losing everything, including my son, once again. I had let my past mistakes become my identity. It was at this time that I met this beautiful woman sitting in the front row, Connie. She was a neighbor going through her own problems and dealing with her own demons. She was compassionate and had a heart of gold. Not knowing my story or my past, only knowing that I was having problems when she invited me into her home to live in her son's room as a guest. Connie was a hard worker and a dedicated mother to three children. A woman that I longed for, but I knew that I could never have because of my issues. Those issues caused me to almost lose any chance with her after I robbed a drug dealer for a quarter kilo and a few thousand dollars. I knew that I couldn't responsibly take these things back to Connie's house, so I holed up in a local hotel and tried to find death at the end of a syringe. Death never came, but after using all the drugs and spending all the money on more drugs, Connie came. She came and rescued me from my solitude and my despair. I came back to her home and our friendship while it evolved into a relationship. Connie had been waiting on a new home to be built that she helped fund and build with Habitat for Humanity. She said I could move in with her if only I stopped using cocaine. And my response, it was a lie before I ever spoke the word okay. That night we moved in, I was on drugs. And in the following 18 months, it continued to a point where we lost her home. We moved 250 feet down the street into a rental that every morning we could step out our front door and see our past failure staring at us from down the road. In December of 2010, Connie told me that she was pregnant and I was elated. Finally a reason for me to quit using drugs, as if my four other children didn't matter. I promised her I'd get clean after one more party, and that party lasted for four more months. And the amounts of drugs that I put into my arm, they should have killed me. Connie had finally had enough of me, and she didn't want to bring another child into this world with a man who couldn't be the man that she deserved. So she threw me out, finally making a stand for her and her children. I left the house only to sneak into our foreclosed home with a blanket, my drug kit, and a bank card. I spent all of our tax return putting death into my body, seeking then to the miserably led life that was never going to get any better. And like so many times before, the drugs ran out, the money was gone, and I found myself crawling back to Connie begging for another chance. This time, though, it was different. Connie looked different to me, like I had killed off a part of her that had once truly loved me. She allowed me back for the day and took me with her and the kids to the Lee County Fair. And my friends, as I stand here before you today, let me tell you how big our God really is. As we walked through the fair, my kids enjoying themselves, and me detoxing off the drugs that were slowly leaving my system, we went inside to see a shark show. Walking through the crowds, a man came up to me and asked if I had ever heard of a program called CR. He then handed me a voucher for a free meal for my family at a place called Grace Church. He spoke of how his life had been changed. He had quit drinking and gotten sober. This man named Chuck was standing before me, and he was telling me my story. And on the, fire, the following Friday night, March 12, 2011, my wife and I walked through the doors to this very church. The parking lot was filled with Harleys, and a man that I'll never forget named Carl opened the door and gave me a big welcoming hug. To tell you the truth right now, I was a little weirded out and uncomfortable. <laughs> yet at the same time, yet at the same time, I felt like I was truly home again. We walked into the sanctuary to Christian rock music playing, and that was followed by a large tattooed bald guy teaching a lesson <laughs> on powerlessness, the lesson that I needed to hear most. Romans 7.18 reads, I know that nothing good lives within me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. They did an altar call that night, and again, that place right there, that's the spot where I found myself kneeling, crying out to the God that I turned away from, begging him to take my will and replace it with his own, to save me from myself, free me from the bondage of self, Help me to face life as a man sober, unchained from the shackles of active addiction. Principle one of the Celebrate Recovery Step book reads, Realize I am not God. 
I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. I left the altar to go to CR 101, where I heard the testimonies of men and women who would later become my friends and accountability partners, sharing their story of where they were at and where they are now. So what has changed since that night? One simple word, everything. Pastor Pastor West once said during a talk that no no one likes change except for a baby. Another friend of mine, Bill, says it like this, nothing changes when nothing changes. If you've been around here long enough, you're going to get sick of hearing that, but it's the truth. Well, guess what simple thing that they asked me to do when I first got here? Change everything. And that's exactly what I did. My total surrender to a higher power than myself was a game changer. Sometimes in order for us to win the battle, we need to surrender. Because in a war, there are many battles. One battle doesn't give the outcome to a war. So surrendering to a power greater than myself, in my case, that's exactly what I had to do. I had tried rehabs, friends, doctors, switching from one buzz to another, and relied on my own willpower for far too long. I had to give it over to God. God was and still is the only saving grace for me. I may not have understood a whole lot about him when I walked through those doors, but in time that changed. Pastor George has given many a lesson talking about give as much of yourself to God as you can to as much of God that you understand. And in my brokenness, that's exactly what I not only needed to hear, but what I also needed to do. So if you're sitting here and you're struggling with either what it is that brought you here or what taught that you were taught growing up or not really understanding this God thing, don't worry. It really is all about baby steps. And you'll see as you continue to come back that God and his son Jesus, as well as the Holy Spirit, are not so much taught as they are caught. When I caught on, and my life really started deep and was around nine months in, when that freaking squirrel that used to run aimlessly around in the cage of my brain finally stopped running. I'll never forget that morning when everything was finally quiet. My obsessive and compulsive brain and the constant noise of my past finally was silent. Some of you may be thinking that I drank the Kool-Aid. and No, not even close. God has just done some really amazing things in my life, and he continues to this very day. I'm a pretty smart guy when I'm sober, and I read not only the Bible, but recovery books. I've read a book about my soul, and I continue to read that book. Another tool in my library is Battlefield of the Mind. These books help me to become more informed, and they also strengthen my love for the God that I serve. And I've really grasped how much he loves us, after giving us his son to save us, not just from the sins of our past, but the sins of our now. A pastor can teach you a lot, but if you're really interested in following Jesus, I found it best to discover and research him on my own, and not just follow from someone telling me that I should. I owed it to myself to read the greatest love story ever written and how I am talked about in that story. And it's not just me, but it's all of you sitting in here as well. So back to changing everything. The next big challenge for me was to find a sponsor. And I shopped around, not just the rooms here, but also outside recovery meetings. A Friday and a Tuesday night with a Sunday service was not going to be enough for a 24-7, 365-day-a-year addict to survive. I went to NA, AA, as well as CA. And in all those places, I not only asked for the phone numbers, I actually used them. That isn't easy, but to a newcomer like me at the time, it was detrimental in keeping me clean. That squirrel up here that kept me awake a lot of hours running and running, trying to find any excuse to push me back over the ledge, talking to active active recovering people helped me from actually feeding this squirrel. It also led to relationships that blossomed to friendships. I was able to see who I related to best before asking for sponsorship. And the first sponsor that I had, I kept for about 90 days. And I noticed we had a great friendship, and and he was really able to relate to my story. But the thing was is I also saw that when I would call him angry and things like that, he didn't really put me too much in check. And at that time, the Chris that walked through these doors, I needed to be put in check. So I actually went from my sponsor to his sponsor, which is somebody who invested into me 
and, and told me what it was that I didn't want to hear and didn't sugarcoat anything for me. So after finding that sponsor, we immediately started working the steps because I was coming from such a dire situation, I had to do whatever was needed of me to find relief as well as handle the problems and baggage that I carried around for all those years. Within 60 days, I had joined my first men's step study. We started with 32 men. By the end of the year-long course, we were down to six. It was in that year and study that I also dealt with the hardest thing that I faced in recovery, and that was death. Death from this disease that is cunning, baffling, and powerful. No matter how long you're around, those rooms, around these rooms, never forget that. A friend that I was not only in the step study with, but I went to Ruth Cooper and detox every Thursday night, had a relapse and an overdose. After seeing him in the hospital, he came home and seemed like he was getting back on track. And one week before my one year anniversary, he took his own life because of this disease. A little over a year ago, another graduate of our step, first step study and a friend of ours, as well as a groomsman in my wedding, Stewie, he also succumbed to this disease and suffered a pretty bad death. If not for the men that I met and spent time with in our step study, if not for the constant crying out to God, even getting angry with him, and him still understanding me, if not for one year realizing that the worst thing that I could do was to pick up a drink or drug to celebrate his friend's life like I had so many times before, I'd be right there with him. My friends, this program works if you work it. Six years later, I'm a living testimony to that. But I can tell you, it doesn't come without a cost. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to go to any length. You have to be willing to invest more time than you invested in tracking down your next fix, your next buzz, your next dollar to support your habit. It comes at a cost, but with that cost comes a major reward. Freedom. Freedom from active addiction, the repair of broken relationships, money back in the bank, kids that love being around you, family members that hug you instead of slamming the door, the best part, being able to face the person staring back at you in the mirror in the morning, and the grateful feeling that spreads throughout your heart when you're able to look at that person. Since that first step study, I've co-led and led four more, totaling five in the past six years, further peeling back the layers of the onion of my life, addressing the many hang-ups that led to my drug usage. You see, this is not a race. It's a marathon. The prize, not finishing first, but finishing. These classes have brought me to where I am today, a beloved child of God and a person of worth. And to all of you sitting here, this gift is available to you as well. Going from being selfish to being fully selfless, putting others, not, putting others needs, not wants, to those codependents out there, um, and discovering what God's true purpose for your life is. My wife, Connie, agreed to finally marry me after one full year of sobriety. My response? <laughs> after one full year of sobriety, and my response? Let's wait one more year and see how much more God can enrich our lives. <laughs> so we got married in the sanctuary one week after my second year clean and sober. And since that time, we have done recovery and ministry as a family. We both, only took, we both not only took, but led step studies. Took four marriage courses to strengthen our bond with each other and God. <laughs> Within the first six months of us being married. <laughs> we are part of Shoes of Hope. For five years, we have volunteered in the Angel Tree Ministry. And have both taken our walk to Emmaus, as well as volunteered on multiple walks. And almost five years ago, I was led by God to youth ministry, trying to help out with our youth that may not have a positive male role model in their lives. And that is where I met two men who have been instrumental in where I am today, Taylor Foley and Taylor Brown, the middle and high school youth pastors here at the Cape Campus. They led me in helping with student ministries and becoming a small group leader. And through their guidance, I also volunteered for Jesus for Juveniles, taking in and sharing the gospel to a group of young men who are incarcerated for making the same mistakes a lot of us have made. And due to my past, I was blocked from getting into the facility. And that is where Pastor Wes, Taylor Foley, and my dear friend John Vogel stepped in and spoke up for me to the leader of the facility. 
So two years ago on a Friday, the facility actually began bringing a small group of young men here to Grace for Celebrate Recovery. And after a large group, we would go upstairs to the youth building, and John and I would lead these men in lessons, trying to strengthen their faith and developing relationships. After some staff changes, the boys didn't come as regularly, but God, he wasn't through with me yet. Excuse me. September of 2015, as I worked part-time in the facilities guy at our Shores campus, my friend and pastor Sherry Lacey came to me with a request. If I could put together some testimonies and games for the youth at the Shores until they could fill the position of a youth pastor. If you could have only seen her face when I told her that I had lesson plans that I had written for the youth at JFJ, that I had been mentored in writing by Taylor and Taylor. She allowed me to share these lessons. And in that time, I was also feeling led by God to submit my, submit my application for the youth pastor position. With no college degree, a past that some would say disqualified me as an applicant, and faith in our God above, I applied. One month later, I was contacted by the guide team that I got the job. Thank you, God. <laughs> Due to some struggles in the beginning, we, we started with six youth, three of those being my own children. <laughs> and in the time that has passed, we are up to 35 youth that come regularly to a place where they are safe from judgment, safe from chaotic environments, and learn valuable life lessons as well as getting to hear about Jesus, all to the glory of God. You see, my value didn't decrease from someone else's inability to see my worth because the mighty God that I serve saw past all of that. And in time, that can happen to the newcomer, as it did for me. On June 3rd, on June 3rd myself along with Taylor Brown and Taylor Foley, and 15 of our youth, some that are here tonight, returned home from Esteli, Nicaragua, where we got to be the hands and feet of Jesus to four churches and their congregations helping in their children's ministry and developing relationships that I will never forget. Not too bad for a person with a past like mine. In closing, I want you to focus on this question. Have you ever noticed how a car's windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror? Because what God has in store for you is so much bigger looking forward compared to focusing on what's behind you in the distance. Jesus loves you. And so do I. Thank you for letting me share.